And we've created a scope of work, which is a, an Excel document that has all of the goals that we want to um, aim for and the different tasks associated with those. And I haven't even shared that entirely with the group. I've shared an outline of what those things are. copy of it in there, but those copies are here too. And then we've sort of uh, started to sign ourselves up for the different tasks and, and how we're going to move forward on that. So again, we're just on meeting four right now, so really we um, are just at the beginning. We've also uh, got a Dropbox share file so that we can all collaborate on these different documents as we move forward as well. So all of the infrastructure for our group is in place and uh, we're just getting ready to take off. So these are the things that are on that scope of work. And um, these are the things that were also the recommendations in the action plan that we should be focusing on uh, to move forward. So if you want to create a website, which will be housed in the SWANA website that Cameron is, is really creating for us. And on that, we'll have a, a database of, of the different um, stakeholders, the different collectors and processors, and also the public drop-off locations. Um, we do want to do uh, There we go. So here's the website. Here's the public recycling um, drop-off location that we have so far. This list has eight locations on it, and we're really hoping to increase that substantially in the coming year, um, working with all of our group members. But I'm really excited that there's even that, because before we started working on this group, I didn't know of any. You know, and so now in my position as recycling coordinator in Kane County, when people call and say, I've got this car, what do I do with it? I say, well, let me just get out this list and I'm going to have this on my website very soon and I can usually direct them somewhere that's nearby them. So that's really exciting, wonderful. So the other things that will be on the website, we're going to have a resource library um, and some documents to share as well with, uh, with the public. We'll have updates on our activities and, and what we're up to in case anybody else is uh, wanting to get involved or has input, you know, they, that's the link to us. This, this new website will also have legislative updates as other states and ourselves um, move forward with the legislative movement. Another way that um, we can increase collection besides public drop-off locations is possibly just these one-day collection events, uh, one of which I had recently along with my electronics and books recycling, I decided to uh, do an extravaganza where I collected, uh, you know, block styrofoam and textiles and did document shredding and latex paint. And uh, and then, because of this group, I thought, oh my gosh, what about carpet? Can we collect carpet? And so I called Eugene and, and I go green and talked to him and he's like, sure, you know, let's do it. We can bring a container. So they came and brought this container in the morning and uh, Patrick O'Connor, was it, that was there that day? Oh, hi. <laughs> cool. And, uh, <laughs> it was really exciting because in the first hour, it's a six hour event, and in the first hour, already it was like half full. And so I was thinking, oh, and we had this discussion, should we go get another container? And we decided, yeah, we better because it's going to fill up and overflow. We're probably going to fill two containers. So, yep. So he went off to get another container, came back, dropped it, picked up the full one, and we filled two 40 cubic yard containers in six hours. 10,000 pounds of carpet and padding. So that's really, a, I think, a great other option for collection where you can just get a big bulk at once and you don't have to have the infrastructure in place or a permanently monitored location um, of any kind. So that's exciting. Uh, also, the other parts of increasing collection are towards education and outreach. And then we want to look at best practices as well for creating permanent drop off locations. And so that's something going to talk about now as well, what are all, you know, how do we control contamination, how is the money going to support it financially, and then of course, um, how we can keep a curbside collection, and that's really going to be something we have to look into and research, because of course all the different communities are different, how they charge for large curbside garbage.
they won. And um, go ahead and to the next one. So the California bill came in 2010, and that's a uh, comprehensive, and it's an, e an EPR bill, right? Would you consider that an EPR bill? I thought you said something to the contrary. Are you talking about me? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. <laughs> me? I'm still in. I'm, I'm still in my park from last night. <laughs> so it's a. Yes, it is an EPR bill. Okay. So, it's, so they call it a recycling incentive bill. The industry does. Um, so it's it's not full producer responsibility, but part to incentivize the recycling. Right. And care is the um, overseeing body on that as well. So. Uh, we have group members on the CARE board and, and also just uh, very, very interesting that's what we're hearing about that and, and just looking to see how that's all working and, and what the, you know, what's working and what's not and how, how can we uh, use that model to, to learn from. In Minnesota, a bill was proposed and the, uh, there was a split between the House and the Senate. The House bill had both carpet and paint stewardship in it and that then in the Senate they cut the carpet piece out just the paint, paint remained and then that passed. So that was unfortunate. A little bit of a tease. And then in New York, they've uh, introduced carpet um, in PR as well. So we're just waiting to see what happens with that one. And those are the real numbers um, in my presentation if you're interested. So, uh, so the policy, excuse me, I have to The policy piece is, I think, looking more at internal policy within local governments and, and you know, architectural firms or, or other stakeholders to try and get, um, you know, post-consumer content in their purchases and then recycling um, mandates in a way inside those policies as well so that we can help drive it that way. So we're still, again, just at the beginning, this is something we just need to look at. So I don't really have much to say about it yet. So, there is an elephant here, and we do have to face it, because the end market development, which is a really big piece of this puzzle, uh, there's, there's different kinds of carpet, which I never knew, and I knew that some was made out of plastic bottles, that's about it, I've heard that in my, in my industry, but the nylon six and then on six six are two kinds that are very, very recyclable. The fibers are easily um, collected, sheared, and then melted down and recycled. So, not really down, process. So, uh, the PPE, polypropylene, also has some existing um, end markets and uses. The problem child is the polyethylene trephalate, and that's uh, commonly known as PET. Those fibers are not as recyclable. They just, you, you can't uh, currently really do much with them. And so, that's uh, something that is a huge concern in the industry right now, and there was just a, the CARE conference, apparently that was just the, the main topic, was like, what are we going to do about this PET? Because it is a problem. <laughs> so, we, we, we do have to look at it. Because PET flake is half to two-thirds the cost of nylon, so it's cheap to make and it's cheap to sell. And in this current economy, people are really happy about cheaper carpet. And especially, I think, uh, multi-family dwellings, of course, they have to replace the carpet every couple of years anyway. So they're looking for the cheapest thing they can get because they're going to put it in and they're going to tear it out. So it makes sense to a lot of people. But unfortunately, it does not make sense in the recycling um, system. Uh, and there's a huge swell of it because, because of so we don't really have any solutions right now, but um, we are looking at them and there are people working on it. I know that CARE is looking into it and we've been having discussions here, but and um, I'm sure that there will be more discussion about it, so I won't go into it too much. There's a little quote from the floor covering weekly that, that outlines some of the numbers there because it's like uh, 24%, but basically a quarter is PET of what's coming out, and that's growing all the time because it's becoming more and more popular, and it's been manufacturing more and more of it all the time as well. So we look at it in one of 
two ways. We can look at it like the glass is half empty, and we've got a big problem here, and we don't really know what we're going to do because there's a, a huge influx of this material. We don't know what to do with it. It really doesn't look like anything great on the horizon as far as solutions goes. So if we try and stop it, is that even possible? Can we you know, tax it to make it the same price as the other carpet so that it's not as, you know? These are, so these are the questions we're asking, but you know, Cameron and I were talking about this half, glass half empty or half full thing the other day, and I thought, well, looking at it as if half full, we could say that the need will drive the market. And there are people looking at it, and there are solutions being talked about and explored. And, and uh, I really have hope, especially because we're so well positioned right now in this group to address this issue. And we've got a lot of great minds here and a lot of great connections uh, within the group that will we'll find some solutions. And, This quick question, maybe not address it, uh, the other speakers. So what happens to that PET now when they recycle the car? Yeah. Is it going to the landfill? Sorry. Yeah. Landfill still? It is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, who's paying the cost for those locations where the carpet is being collected? And do you have a cost of what that is? Is it costing the county, or is there a drop-off fee? Or what's the cost? So those are all um, independent companies and there are char charges uh, to drop off to the public, but they're all different. And so we have on our list, here's the phone number call for pricing. Um, so I can, I mean, what's the range do you think of? I was, oh, the question because I was trying to phone off. Right, <laughs> the car to drop it off. Your specific drop off was? Uh, oh, the, mine when I did the collection event was free for the public and I paid, uh, what, $250 to have it was okay. there. Okay, 175, which is very, very affordable, and then the public is just free for them to do that. But so one of the things to get a handle on is the costs, and it's they're so variable um, that to gather that data right now would be very important. Right, and then also versus the curbside options that people have right now, so that we can try and look at how we're going to incentivize them loading it in their car and driving it somewhere for say. I think the next three speakers may talk about their business model and maybe there's some cost information. What about the issues, the health issues, what's on it? 